and who you're making it for. If you're making it for a kid, obviously you're going to do that. It's going to be a lot shorter. If you're going to do for, say, uh, like keychain or something, it would be shorter than 30 inches. Otherwise, that would be long or 30 centimeters. Otherwise, it would be super long. <laughs> Well, the one lady that I was working with in um, Hills Are Alive, she chose to make a very long one and used it as a hat band. That too, yeah. Um, it all depends on what your what use is going to be. Yeah. But, but, um, and, uh, and other people have made a hangings out of them so that they had something to hang on their wall. And these are small sticks, make good ones, because then they're, they're each unique. And, um, and fingers weaving is, is unique to, to the weaver. Um, and it's a time of learning what kind of tension you want on your Your weave. <laughs> Ray, can you tell us a little bit more about the Métis history and the history of the sash? Well, uh, as I said, the, the sash started out as a item that was necessary, um, and it was made with with leather um, to provide weightlifters and that use use similar items now, um, and I have no idea what they're called. So it's the like back, back support. support. Um, when lifting heavy lift. loads, they used to use it also around their foreheads, the women, so that they could carry more on their, their upper back, which would save their lower back, obviously. And they were used, they, the men could use them as tump lines, I think they were called, that helped them when they were pulling and hauling things. Um, and... They, they used them when they were um, pulling freighter canoes over, over a, uh, a portage. Um, and I can't talk and weave at the same time. Um, they also so use them to do one really well. Um, to use like the strands, they could pull out different strands in order to use it for say stitching, if they needed to say stitch up a cut or they could use them for stitching up their clothes. If there was a tear that they needed to fix, they could pull out different strands out of it. And one of the things that, for me, when I look at our sashes, is that any of these small strands, they're like us as people. And if you take one strand You can break them really easy. They can be pulled out, they can be snapped off, they can be broke. Quite easy, just like us as people when we're facing hard times. But when you twist them together, like we have our families, that single strand becomes really really strong and when they're woven together like our sashes it's our communities our nation nothing will break that they're very very powerful and and so to me the sash is our nation many different colors none of them more important than the other one but all coming together 
and making an unbreakable whole. And I guess in, in this time of, of stress and trouble, that that's an important thing for us to remember is that, um, that what we're going through, our ancestors went through hundreds, hundreds of years before, and nothing has, has ended us, and as Métis people, we will be here forever. We are an integral part of the fabric of Canada. So I'm just tightening up my weave just a little bit because it's pretty loose in there and I like mine a little bit tighter than uh, than than loose and that's just a preference. So you just grab the string that you were wanting to tighten up, move it up just a little bit and then you can take the next one and tighten it up. Make sure your threads stay in place. So these make really easy, and you can use any kind of yarn. Um, you can use the hand woven yarn as well and different textures. Um, it's, I find that if you use a similar weight, it makes it a lot easier. Um, when, when you're weaving. But it makes really easy gifts for, for kids to do um, that they can gift their, their friend with or they can make a bookmark for their mom or dad or cook them. We always enjoy gifts mm -hmm. from our grandchildren. And it doesn't require any electricity. And although I think there are YouTube videos up of weaving, those aren't needed either. And it takes our kids out of their, their iPads and iPhones and gives them something to do with their hands. Um, for the purpose of today, I picked two very contrasting colors so that you can really see what's happening. Especially through video that way, you know, it's hopefully a little easier for a person that's watching to see. And we have supplies for these down at Shining Mountains if people want to come and try their hand. Um, I know Candace has been sending a, a video to um, some of our partners so that they could use these with, with their um, participants who are Social isolating. Yes, are still social isolating. And this is a, a really peaceful and relaxing thing to do when it's not being taped. Woo, such an amazing day so far. If you've been tuning in for the whole program, um, 
thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Now we're going to catch up with Brian Lazat of Métis Local 492, and he's going to tell you a little bit about his organization and speak a little bit on behalf of the Métis people. Check it out. Hi, I'm Brian Lazat. I'm currently the president of Métis Nation of Alberta Local 492. Our boundaries stem from Morningside down to Didsbury in the south and east from Castor to Eckville, half of Eckville actually, which is kind of funny. I'm always joking with Rocky Mountain House Local 845 on the boundary is Main Street or one of the streets out there. However, I'd like to say happy National Indigenous Peoples Day, longest day of the year and shortest night, of course. But I would just like to say that I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be Métis. I'm proud to serve the community in whatever aspect I can. And right now I'm finding myself out at Tail Creek Cemetery. Now Tail Creek has been one of the earliest uh, settled by the Métis. So there's a, there was a, it's not an actual settlement, but Métis were, had gathered and made this their winter home in 1700s and 1800s and this cemetery has some of the people that are buried that lived worked lived loved and passed away here uh, i'm out here just to make sure that everyone is aware that metis just have not just arrived we've been in the area for for generations a few generations uh, metis people of course from european and native canadian descent so they're not first nations people uh, they are of mixed mixed race they used to say they're mixed race however with uh, the recognition now we can understand the determination and through genealogy and uh, family history we can find out that the metis are all connected and are from a specific area which is manitoba the Red River area, and those things. So with, with Manitoba, Tail Creek was the largest settlement of Métis west of Winnipeg. And that, that to me is an interesting point. I grew up further north from here, but I've been in the Red Deer area since 1980. I came out here today just to share with you the, uh, the area and the fact that the cemetery is here. Now the cemetery is here because Métis people have been in the area for a, quite, a while, quite a long time. And uh, there are graves here from early 1800s. And apparently the, the, the Tall Creek area had the biggest uh, Métis settlements and the Métis people coming in west of Winnipeg. So we have a long history of Métis people and Métis within the uh, Central Alberta area for a long time. And uh, I just wanted to show you some of the shots here. Here we can see the beautiful valley. And this is Tail Creek landing area where the settlers lived. Location is 50 kilometers east on Highway 11 of Red Deer. So if you travel to on Highway 11 at the junction point is Highway 21. Just past, if we go up past uh, two or three kilometers, take a right hand turn, there's a signage there and then about five kilometers down a dirt road, you will find Tail Creek Cemetery. At the junction of Highway 21, Tail Creek Campground is just down the hill as you turn on to Highway 21, about two kilometers down the road. So it's a beautiful area and well worth the visit. Uh, I'd like to speak about the local for a bit. Uh, local 492 is in Red Deer. The boundaries are from Morningside down to Didsbury 
and from Castor over to Eckville. On the other side, east west of Eckville is uh, Rocky Mountain House, uh, local 4A845. So we've got people and resources for the locals and uh, it would be nice to see more people become involved in the local membership. Uh, of course we have events, we'll be having more events coming up um, and the important thing is for people to become involved. Uh, with the COVID we've also had, uh, we've got resources so you can get in contact with us on the Facebook page so just to know that we as a local are trying to support, trying to come through and be uh, become a resource for all of our people uh, during this time of need. Tail Creek Landing is where the people lived and traveled from up here through the Buffalo Lake uh, and lived throughout the area here for a few centuries, not just generations. So. There you have that, and I uh, hope you enjoyed the program today. A lot of the agencies within Red Deer uh, have, put, have put time into producing this program, getting together, and I hope you enjoy the day and this program and enjoy our Native history and culture. Thank you so much, Brian, for those wonderful, inspiring words on behalf of Métis Local 492. I hope you guys are enjoying all the beautiful content that was shared today. I just wanted to tell you a little story about my, my necklace here. This is called a horse mask. So basically, when the horses were, were traveling, we like to dress everything up. And the Nest Pierce would, would make all this quill work, and, and all these other tribes would do beautiful bead work, and they would... They would decorate all these beautiful hides, the deer hides, the moose hides, the buffalo hides, and they would create ornaments and things for themselves. And one of the things they created for the horses was the horse mask that went over the horse. And I particularly have a great relationship with the horse spirit because my dance that I do, the fancy dance, is related to that horse movement. You know, so a horse kind of moves fast and runs fast. The style that I dance when I'm in the power trail is called men's fancy dance. So some uh, of a little short story I wanted to share with you. And so as we get on to our next video, I want you to keep that in mind that the little tiny little stories that and lessons that are involved and all the teachings that are involved with some of the videos that we're presenting to you today. So here we go. You know, you guys don't want to hear me blab all day. Here we go with our next video for National Indigenous Day. Check it out. Hello everybody, my name is Corky, um, my other name is Teresa, and my very special name is Red Cloth Woman. I had something I always wanted to do since I was a little girl, and that was to be part of writing a book. And I say part because you need help. Sometimes you need help, just like when you need help from other people in your community that know about things that you don't. For the sharing circle, I needed the help of a publisher and an editor, and most especially a very beautiful artist. Me and my little friend, Kokomawa, we go a lot all over the place. We go to mini schools, we go to um, some conferences. Sometimes we just go hang out downtown and drink coffee. But most of all, this little owl, is very special to me because I really love owls. The sharing circles in the Indigenous community are something that work really, really well. And we've seen, this, you know, some big arguments get resolved with the use of the sharing circle, which number one is confidentiality. You don't talk about, you know, what goes on outside of the circle. The other one is everybody to be listened to with respect. And we don't talk, we don't giggle, we don't answer phones or play games while the sharing circle is happening. And that everybody has a chance to speak, which is sometimes all we need is just to be listened to. So I'm going to read my book, The Sharing Circle. I, um, 
I'm very proud of it. You know, I, I, I love how each, each little character has a story. The little woodpecker, if you watch, if you read the book, you'll see that just about on every page is that little woodpecker will show up. And that little woodpecker, his traditional name is Papa Thay in OG Cree, Ojibwe Cree. And that's my little brother, Ralph Flett. I actually called him my little big brother. He was young, but he knew a lot and he taught me many things. And he passed away, but that's how I keep him with me. Kokomao, I don't know, might be someone here that we know that kind of wears a scarf like that and is kind of nosy and sees everything. The rabbits are my aunties. The fox is River, my son. The other fox is my adopted daughter, Tanya. The buffalo represents all the old women in the community, the buffalo women who provided and made sure their community was taken care of in many ways. Partridge is my Auntie Irene because she was very colorful like a partridge and uh, always looked very beautiful with all her jewelries and lipsticks. And the deer, well, because I live in Red Deer. The skunk and the badger, either, you know, they're animals that you don't hear about too much. Not too many people write books about skunks and not too many people sing songs about badgers, but they're both very special animals in the way that they will never, they will never get involved in a bad fight unless they absolutely have to. And they will always seek out other ways to, to um, avoid conflict. You know, they'll do a timeout or they'll go listen to some music or play their drum or sing or do art before they're the type of people that will really think hard and not uh, get into the argument right off the hop. The skunk is my sister Smokey, which she's still angry about, but we won't get into that. And the eagle is my husband, Lynn. So all these people, all these little animals have a story and they all mean a lot to me. Should we read our story, Owl? Cook them? Okay. This book is called The Sharing Circle and it's dedicated with all my love to my husband, Lynn, to our son, River, and to all the rivers that carry life to the lands. It's also dedicated with big love and thanks to the amazing Teddy, Emma, and Jessica, folks at Medicine Wheel Education. They're a perfect circle of talent. The Sharing Circle. Morning Star and River were two funny foxes who were the very best of friends, and they lived with the skunk, the rabbits, the deer, and the badger, and buffalo on the Great Plains, where the grasslands stretched out for miles under a never-ending sky. Doesn't that look nice, Owl? Aren't you glad the flowers are back? Yeah, me too. Every day, Morning Star River and their friends played together in the grass, and they hunted for bugs, and they swam in the creek, and they lay on their backs looking for shapes in the clouds, and when the sun began to set, they all raced home to their cozy beds. Did you ever look for shapes in the clouds? Yeah? Yeah? You today. One day, while the animals splashed in the creek, River gave Morning Star a playful shove, but Morning Star lost her footing and fell. And she was so angry that she growled at River. And they had a terrible fight. They told each other, I don't want to be your friend anymore and crept back to their homes with hurt feelings. Isn't it sad when kids fight? Sometimes though, they just gotta get it out. The next day, the two foxes refused to talk to each other and made everyone very sad to see their friends fighting. And without their funny playmates, none of the other animals wanted to play. And everyone gossiped about the argument like people do and began to pick sides, kind of like, I'm going to be your friend, but I won't be her friend, or I'll be his friend, but he can't come to my birthday party or things like that. Those things cause hurt feelings. When one of the older buffaloes heard about it, she knew that something must be done, and she took a braid of sweet grass as a gift to a great horned owl called Coco. That's you. 
Yeah. The wise and mighty Cookham always knew how to solve problems, and she listened as the kind buffalo told her story. Well, I think it's time we held a sharing circle, she said. So the buffalo and the owl went down to the creek, and all of the animals gathered together to make one big circle. Many things we need for a good life are like a circle, said Kokomo, and water is one of them. What can you tell me about the water cycle? Anybody? There's water in the lakes and the big oceans, said a smart young badger. That evaporates and turns into clouds. The clouds make rain and the rain shares itself with the people, animals, and trees. It travels into streams and creeks and makes its way back to the lakes and the big ocean. Well done, said Kokum. Isn't that badger smart? We need that circle of water to live. It is a sacred circle. And when something that happens that may harm our community, we can all come together and form our own sacred circle. We call it a sharing circle. Why don't you tell everyone why we're here today, Kokum asked the buffalo woman. Well, Morningstar and River have been arguing and everyone has hurt feelings now, said the buffalo. Today we're going to share those feelings and we're going to talk about what happened. The owl nodded. That's right. Everyone has a place in the circle and everyone should feel safe and respected in it. And you can share it by talking about your feelings, offering suggestions, or talking about how you can help. But you don't have to speak unless you want to, unless you feel perfectly safe. Sometimes to feel perfectly safe, it's good to have someone with you, someone who makes you feel safe, like a mom or a friend or a teacher or an elder, someone who makes you feel safe. The animals passed talking stick to their left in the direction as the sun travels. The foxes, the skunk, the rabbits, the deer, the badger, and the buffalo took it in turns to hold the stick and speak. Some of them talked about their feelings and some of them didn't but they all felt like they were part of the sharing circle. I wanted to help, but Morningstar told me to leave her alone, said a young skunk named Smokey. I tried to say sorry, but River wouldn't listen to me, said Morningstar. You called me bad names, said River, with tears in his eyes. Then one of the little rabbits started whispering to her friend, who stretched her front legs, looked around as if she wanted to leave the circle, kind of bored. And Kokum saw this and spread out a large wing to get their attention. You have beautiful wings, Owl. My girl, said Kokum, you can share your feelings when you hold the talking stick, but now you must sit still and listen to each other. The sharing circle is a place of listening and respect. We need to be quiet until it is our turn and we are holding the stick. This time, this time helps us listen, helps us understand, and sometimes, actually more often than not, to see things in a different light. The animals pass the talking stick around the circle a few more times, and even the quiet deer, who was shy in the beginning, became brave when they saw how safe it was to share their feelings. The more the animals talked, the more they came to understand that the argument was all a big misunderstanding. We should have listened to each other and respected one another, said River, and Morningstar agreed. And the two foxes were very happy to be friends again, and mostly so were all the other animals. You see, young ones, Ever since we have lived on this land, ever since the water has flowed, we have always tried our best to respect each other, said Coco. Every animal has a duty to care for another, and everyone has a job to do or a beautiful gift to share. Will we ever hold a sharing circle again, asked Smokey the skunk. Of course, Coco told her. Sharing circles can be used in many different ways. The teachings of the circle have been practiced for a long time in this land. And if we continue to respect the teachings, they always will. And the animals all thank Coco and the gentle old buffalo woman for bringing them all together. Then they all ran down to the creek to swim and play together beneath the enormous sky. The end.
And when you finish reading your book, this is what you do. You have to close your book dramatically. The end. <laughs> you are such a good helper, Owl. Thank you. I hope you like my book. If you love this story and would like to have a copy of this book for yourself, you can order it from Medicine Wheel Education Incorporated. If you are four to six years old, this is the one you want to order. The, Sh the Circle of Sharing and Caring. And this book, The Sharing Circle. We are so grateful to our elder, Corky, for sharing her wisdom and her knowledge in this story. And hope that you did too. Thanks. Have Aww. a happy National Indigenous Peoples Day. All right, I tip my hat to that great knowledge that was shared thank you so much for sending in that video and creating it for us to to all learn those beautiful teachings so now we're gonna move on with our program and i hope you're enjoying it as much as i am on this beautiful national indigenous day just send it to a friend and tell you tell them that this amazing video is on so here we go with our next amazing video awesome video however you want to call it here we go Check it out. Stone Circle, based on a design by Tom Trainbear uh, from Sixica. He worked for us at the Friendship Center back in the 80s. And he said, uh, there's no, uh, uh, nothing in Red Deer really to represent Aboriginal people. Uh, every every corner has a steeple, so there's nothing for us. And so uh, he uh, gave me the design for this, uh, uh, for this installation. And, uh, Eight, uh, eight stones in the center uh, pointing to the directions and then 12 around the outside representing quite a number of our ceremonies. Uh, Scott Rogers, uh, first dances, you know, uh, you know, just lots of them. And so, uh, so that was uh, back in 85, 6. Anyway, uh, and he uh, uh, gave that to us uh, and um, this was installed in 2013. Now, if you have a look down here, that was done soon after he gave us the design uh, where everybody came together at Rotary Park. And because um, that was one of, the, one of the first places that they offered for us to put it in. But the problem was, uh, soon after they made the offer, there was a, a, a plan to put a cultural center there. So, of course, the stone circle got moved. Um, so, uh, but the rocks were still in a, in a, in an ice cream pail in my garage for all those years. And so when we finally got this put in, uh, the MacArthur's, uh, Don, oh, Don, no, we got Don Delatero and, uh, Brian MacArthur, uh, put this together for us and installed it. And that's now part of the installation because everybody that came to the first, you know, sort of dedication brought That one will go over here. Bring that one over. Over there? Yeah. Go up. Yeah. Okay, we need two in the back. What's that? We'll space them out after we we're done. Go in that V. Between the red and green. Yeah, right there. Okay, the next one over here. Get two for the front. Chris cross with that last one you put. Yeah. Okay, two in the front. Okay, you guys, memorize this. Yeah, you gotta know where to put the. What's that? Okay, up. Lift her up. 
Okay, clipped. Go up in between that last V. Well, this pretty shield. That that's my Blackfoot name. Last V right there. Right there. No, the other side. Yeah. Cal Williams. That's a residential school name. You need longer rail. That one should be a little longer because we're going to be moving it around. Get a longer one. Today I got invited by uh, my younger brother, uh, Buffalo Collar, to put up this black, this uh, teepee, Blackfoot style. We put up our lodges with the four pole system. We find that it can uh, withstand very strong winds when you have to pour. And our teepees are a perfect cone. Right at the middle of that bow of the teepee, okay? That's where you're gonna tie. They're not as large as this one here. Usually uh, we have probably about a 20 footer. And uh, this is a 30 footer. It's a very tall lodge. The first thing you have to do to put up a, a Blackfoot lodge is to spread out the canvas in half to, to make the measurements. Once you have this in half and you have it all snug, spread out, then you take the four main ones that are going to be holding up all the other poles. You set the two front ones about five, four to five uh, feet from the, uh, the doorway. And you overlap them six to eight inches on both sides. So the front and the back will be, will be the same. If you are gonna put up a teepee where the ground is not level, and it's sloping to the west. The two back ones will go out more than the front. The front, you have to push them in. So that way they align themselves to the slope of the ground. And same, you do the same thing if the slope, if the slope was like this, if it was on the, the, the doorway. The two front ones will overlap more than the back. You have to put the four main ones together right in the middle of that bow is where you're going to tie them. That's where you tie them. And once you measure that, then you, put a, you, you get your main rope that ties the lodge down and we're gonna pull it up. We have to have a bunch of uh, guys to help us when we lift this up. This is a big lodge. Okay, you grab this, you grab this. Put your feet to the, to the rails. This one, this one, yeah. Okay, we're gonna pull on them as hard as you can, okay? Pull on them. Okay. Good. Okay, give me yours. Loosen yours up. Keep yours tight. Give it back to him. Pull on it. Okay, pull. Tight, tight. Okay. Oh, this one. Loosen yours. Okay, pull on it. Okay. Pull on it. Tight. Really pull on it. Pull hard, boy. Okay, Glenn. Same with... This one, no? Pull on this. Once we get this up, we'll, we'll show you how to spread the, the poles, okay? Go up! Straight up! Okay, you guys go under the right. Go under the... Come over. Pull up. Okay, now you, you keep it like this. Pull on it. Yeah. Okay, that, that, that one there. This one here? This one goes over here. The top one goes that way. Go that way, Lynn. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. Right there. Right there. 
Okay, as long as those don't move. Hey, that's okay, you guys. Over here. Over here. Be careful how you move. Okay, uh... Hey, Calvin. Yeah. We want to get our teepee as close to that bush as we can. Okay, that's what I'm saying. We're going to move them back, okay? Should we move that teepee pole out of there? Yeah, get it out of there. Okay, the front can stay there for now. They said it was that way. <laughs> it's almost noon and the sun's over here. Okay, what we can do, we can move it over a bit. Yeah. Where's the sun come up from? in the morning, so be right over here down the... It doesn't have to be perfect, Ace, but... Uh, <coughs> in the winter, yeah. Look at that door, just up, you here. Okay, you guys, hold on to those two front ones. Okay, grab this one here. So that, this, this is really important. This is the main thing that okay. you measure. Right. These four. Once you get this past this, then you just lift it up and put all the other rails. It should... It should have a nice, uh, uh, the teepee should be high enough to let air come in for ventilation, okay? Yeah, so that's about right there? That's too low. That's too low, right? Too low. Okay. Probably six to eight inches. You know, you need a nice breeze, eh? And then the liners fit The liners will, yeah, but the breeze goes up that it draws the smoke up. When I first had a TP, we were only shown once. They only, they only showed us once. And we had to uh, put it up the next year and all the following years, the same way those old people showed us. Whoa, be careful. If you can't comprehend or grasp how you set it up, uh, they're going to laugh at you until you learn how to uh, put it up. <laughs> I want to get a picture of this. Camera's got to be in, it's got to be out. Go up, go up, go up. Sure you're turning it. Come this way. Oh, no. Hold on to the cameras, you guys. We got, it's tied to this side. Go in between those two, Lynn. Huh? It's got to go over to the right. We always have a ceremony. We, we uh, especially if we have tobacco, we offer tobacco to the spirit helpers, to creator, so that he can bless this whole, all the land that's here. And all the people that are going to be coming here will be blessed that they take something good back to their families. The thing that all humans want is to live life in a good way, not to be affected by health or any kind of negative uh, happenings. Boom. Boom. You're the man, right? Where's the doorway? Oh, 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 too far. Right there. Pull it right around, guys. Right around. Right around. How are you going to get up there to stitch it? <laughs> okay, we need a ladder, you guys. Yeah. Any monkeys around? <laughs> Mine are all in the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we need a ladder. Get that flap out with a light pole. Yeah, when you get up there, you can pull that out. You got to get that out, you guys. Go back. Oh, yeah, I see what you're doing. Okay. All right, you got your pegs? Okay. Where did I see a ladder? There was a ladder somewhere. In the lodge. What we call those up there? What? Sapi kinematsis. That means button. Sapi kinematsis. Sapi kinematsis. Ah, sapi kinematsis. It's the smallest and the lightest. AJ. Where did you put that bubble? And in the Blackfoot, we have names for these poles. 
These, these poles, the main ones, they have a name. The ear poles have a name. The ribs have a name, because they do, they do different things, okay? <laughs> One of you ladies, yeah. come help hold this camera. Yeah, no, did you come? You got buttons? <laughs> Holy. <laughs> no pain, no gain. He's doing good, Paul. Right on, Ryan, looking good. <laughs> Once it's over. <laughs> What we're gonna do is we're gonna guys are gonna push them up, okay? Okay. As far as you can. Or yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Hang on, hang on. We're gonna put get up here. We need two guys in over, over here. Grab the rope. Here. No, just these two main ones. The main poles. The main ones. You guys grab the rope and when they're lifting it up, you guys pull it over, okay? Yeah. What do we do? Okay. Grab right. half those guys. Where's the other main poles? The two over there. guy over here. And somebody on the rope. What are we going to do with these ones now? We're going to move them. You're going to push them out. Push them just out. those two? Yeah, just those two. Okay, have have the rope, down, you guys. Right so you got to pull down on the rope so take the pressure out of the pole. Okay, ready, go. Right More? there. Let's see how much they've got uh, to work with outside. So take okay, the the now over here. And you can move them to the pole top. Over here, yeah. bring the rope. Now we're going to go two. The other two, this one. Same time. Ready? Go. Lift yours up. Pull down on it. Pull on it. There. Yeah. Okay, pull on the canvas, you guys. Oh, I feel great. I feel great. Really uh, blessed today. Blessed by the weather and blessed by elders coming to help us today. So uh, the reason we put up this teepee, you know, is to really celebrate uh, who we are as Aboriginal people, as Indigenous people of the land. So we want to put up our different lodges from represent our, our nations and, uh, you know, so it uh, symbolizes, you know, their teachings and uh, how we work together. Because a long time ago, of course, this was, uh, this was Blackfoot land. You know, this belonged to the Blackfoot Nation and as they Crees and Blackfoot made trees, their own treaties, had the relationships that uh, carried on to this day still. So it's a way of honoring all those things from the past. Good job. Yeah. It's a good job, nice though. Nice meeting yeah. you, folks. It's How a good go? job. Okay. It's all so set. Sure to see you again. Keep ah. Super nice. Our ancestors did not have teepees to begin with. They went through an evolution, different uh, phases of, of uh, shelters. Uh, one of our elders explained uh, the sequence of our lodge making, of how we found shelter. And that story was passed down to me so that I could share with others. When our people were here to begin with, they found shelter like the animals. They uh, went into caves, dugouts, and they even used a beaver den to, to find shelter, something that was abandoned. The next phase that they, that they started to get more intelligent, they started to make lean-tos that they can crawl under. Lean-tos were very simple to make. Then they, they found out that they could use hide, buffalo hide, and they started to learn the tanning techniques. At first, they weren't proficient in tanning hide. They had a very rough uh, uh, finish to the tanning that they did. And, uh, but they were able to design a teepee in a cone shape. They were the ones that designed the cone. And today, we still use that uh, design for our teepees. Uh, at first, they used rocks to weigh the canvas, I mean, the, the hide down, to prevent draft from entering the teepee. That's where the teepee rings come from. Those are old lodges. But some of the lodges, especially ones that belonged to a war chief, were, were about this big. They were uh, 
If you see some of the teepee rings, you, you find two uh, fireplaces in the lodge, and that was to, you know, to, to heat up a big uh, teepee. Our people became more intelligent with their tanning, and then they uh, started using pegs to weigh the teepee down. And they had enough opening in there to ventilate their fire so that it goes up into the, uh, the top of the, te the lodge. So our people, they adapted to their environment and they slowly started to find ways to find better shelter. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying the National Indigenous Day event. We have a lot of videos here for you, a lot of amazing presentations and people came together to help create this amazing day. So thank you for tuning in. We're going to go on to our next beautiful video with our, our amazing people who kind of put this, this day together for you. So here we go. Let's check it out with this amazing teachings brought to you here today. Hello everyone, my name is Corky. I'm a Cree Métis woman born and raised in Red Deer. All the teachings I use in my life, my day-to-day -day life, come from this area and come from a very special man that lived down south in Kainai, George Goodstriker. I also sit with behind me my grandfather Bill Joseph and my grandmother um, Christine Fraser Joseph. My, I am very proud of my, my background. I'm very proud of my heritage. And I acknowledge both bloodlines with equal amounts of honor. I am really happy to be sitting in front of you today and to talk, to, talk about something that's very near and dear to my heart because I've seen how it has impacted the young people I've been involved with. It's called the coming of age ceremony. And traditionally, it was just, uh, it was a part of a young person's life. It was one of those steps in their day-to-day -day life and their day-to-day -day growing and their day-to-day -day being in, the, in their community. I believe if, I believe at one point, because of um, the, what happened in our history, this is one of the things that was lost through those really ups and downs of generational trauma. I think now is the time more than ever to start bringing them back in our, in, and be very focused about it because um, it's really important to that youth. What happens in the coming of age ceremony is when that young woman or young man reach that critical point where they're no longer um, considered a child their roles change a little bit and they're taught why those roles change and they're taught why a little bit more will be expected of them and they're also taught who they have in their corner as allies. Now for a young woman the coming of age or coming out ceremony would be traditionally anywhere from four days to a week of a young woman just being alone with her olders her mother, her grandmother, her older sisters, older women in the community. <clears throat> and it usually is around the time of her first uh, menses, which can be a little, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big thing for a young girl. And in the past, these things come with this little tag note of uh, hide it and be, you know, you're ashamed of it. And some young girls call it the curse and things like that. When in reality, it's really the most beautiful thing for a young woman. And the sooner a young woman learns that, the better. Now, um, in that week or in those four days or whatever we do now, you know, sometimes we can't take four days. Sometimes we'll take the weekend. Sometimes we'll take it's, it doesn't matter as long as your spirit and intent is there and as long as you circle around that young woman or young man 
and let them know how precious they are because they are very precious to us. I, I'll share the story of my uh, son, River. When he had his coming of age ceremony, we it was like a, a big celebration. We put up a big teepee. He invited, it was up to him who he wanted in his circle. And he invited his family, his aunties, his uncles, his, his mom, his birth mom, uh, myself. Well, I hope he invited me. <laughs> I did most of the work. And I, um, we fed, we made sure there was lots of food. He invited his football team. He invited his friends. He invited some teachers. And uh, it was just really beautiful to see a mixture of so many people come together in that teepee. Now, when we were all, when uh, it started out with ceremony, and for us, it was the sweat lodge at our family home on the acreage. And for the first two rounds of the sweat lodge, our son, my son and Lynn's son River sat with us on the woman's side. At, uh, and at the beginning of the third round is when the transition happened. River by the sweat lodge leader and myself ceremoniously or pushed him, pushed him over to the men's side. And what happened in that minute is that, not that a mother's job is, is ever done, but I had done what I could to teach him about being gentle, to teach him about how to treat another woman or how to treat a girlfriend or um, about respect and how you treat young women now. It's a little bit different. And it was now up to the men of the community. They will continue his teachings of how to provide, how to be a, a good member of your community, how to help out at ceremonies. And um, in reality, we're never ever done teaching each other or our young people. But for him on that day, after the sweat lodge, when we sat all together in the big teepee, with his entire community around him. We all went around and we talked to River. And each one had a different story about River, about why, why you know, and thank, you know, congratulations on your big day. And I love playing football with River and other people. I like River's sense of humor. And as uh, the people went around, um, you could see River start to sit a little more straight. You could start to see him make more eye contact and look around. And then as it got to the men's side, um, the men started talking to him about, this is what's worked for me as a man. This is what's worked for me as a husband. This is what gets me into trouble. This is what you do when you feel things are starting to go south in the relationship. It was really beautiful to hear the men share. Some of the people, as they spoke, would give River a little gift. And um, his adopted sister Tanya gave him a smudge uh, bag of, uh, with uh, medicines and a shell, matches. He got a drum. Someone gave him a good sharp axe. Someone gave him a good knife, a good hunting knife. Uh, his mushom Sid gave him a rifle, a little rifle that had been uh, River's great-grandfather's. And all these things were set in front of River. So not only did uh, the community provide for him in, in ways of the heart and encouragement, they also provided for him in giving him the tools to provide now, to provide for himself, to provide for his family when he has one, to provide for his community, because it's a give and take. After that ceremony, River walked away knowing who he could call on if he was ever in a bind, who he could phone if um, his car broke down, who he would phone if he was house sitting, mom and dad were gone and the basement started to leak. It was really a beautiful thing. And again, 
I wish something had been done like that for me. And that's, I think that's what drives me now to do it for the young women in our community. And we've done it quite a few times. And again, like it, with River, when the women get around, we talk to that young lady, you know, you're, 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 you have the most beautiful gift of all now. You're, you were known as a life giver. New life comes with you, comes through you, okay? You're, you're, you grow a new life inside of you when it's time and bring it into the world. That's something very special. And the, the uh, moon time goes with that. And so that young girl is taught not to shame herself at that time in the month or let others shame her. She's taught this is about this special time in her life is when she is very strong. She's very connected spiritually. She's very connected um, in all ways. And sometimes out of respect for the people who still need a strong ceremony, she'll withhold from going uh, to any other ceremony. She won't go to the sun dance. She won't go to the swab. She won't go to um, the powwow. She won't prepare feast foods because she's that strong. We believe her to be that strong. And uh, it's it's not about being ostracized. It's not being about being told you're less than and that, oh, no, no, you can't be a part of it. She still is a part of it. She still has her voice, but she still has, now she has a responsibility to, um, to her community in a different way. You know, whether that be sitting back, praying, singing, uh, looking after other things that, um, you know, that are in her home. So it's a, it's a good time. It's a really good time to sit with the young men and the young woman. You know, when we do our coming of age ceremonies here in Red Deer, we make sure always that there's many older women as possible around. We make sure that one of them talks to her about if she's able to make tea and the beauty that's in a cup of tea and how when somebody comes to visit you, you don't even ask, just make them a cup of tea or how to make a plain soup. She's talked to about how to make the ceremony foods for the feast and the tea protocol that goes with it. Uh, she's talked about She's talked to about her responsibilities to herself and her sacredness. And to always let you know, know that how sacred she is, how good she is, how deserving she is of nothing but the best. That young woman will be talked to about how not to give herself away easily and how to make sure that the one she ends up making a life with is absolutely deserving. She also ha um, we all, she, we will also talk to her about, you know, and call us. If you get into a place where you're feeling very bad, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, look around the room at all these people who are sitting with you today, and you can call any one of them. So that's um, why I think it is so important that we focus on it you know, and try our best to keep doing it. It's one teaching, one rites of passage, one ceremony that got lost over time with the brokenness of families that came. And uh, that's one, it's a, it's a good way, you know, that we can encourage our youth. You know, I, I know they get tired of us saying, you're our future, you need to learn this, you, you're our future and, um, but it's true, you know, and they deserve every bit of our time. They deserve every teaching that we can pass them. They deserve every song we can teach them. And um, they deserve a good life. And, the, and when we do this with our young men and our young women, we can walk away knowing that they, they they have a chance, they have a way to follow now. 
with that and uh, again with us behind them. I um, I feel very strongly about this teaching. I can't go too much into it on the video, but it's it's uh, something important, and and I really believe as women we can come together and do our best. Okay, maybe we can't do it in the old days for a week. Maybe we can't do it like in the old days for a weekend, but we can do it for one night. We can do it for one day. We can do it and follow up. And um, I think that's all our youth know, our, and that's all our youth need. Thank you for listening to me. I'd be uh, very willing and very happy to talk with other Indigenous women who, you know, are considering doing this again, or want to do it for their families and for non-Indigenous as well, you know, it's, we can't teach, give away too many of our teachings, but we can do, be there for each other. And uh, yeah, that's what I want to talk to you about today. Games for many Aboriginal people were and still remain today more than just a time of play. Traditional games could represent or depict events such as a chase, a harvest, events in nature, the agricultural cycle, events of war, or the probable outcome of human endeavors. A large number of games can be found throughout North America. While many of the games might use different material and have different rules, there are many commonalities with a large number of these games. Traditional Indigenous games can be divided into two categories, games of chance and games of dexterity. Games of chance would be where a bone or another object might be hidden and an opponent might try to locate it. Another game of chance might be where an object like a dice is thrown and a scoring system is in place to determine the winner. Games of dexterity include games which use strength or balance or eye-hand coordination and flexibility. Many of these dexterity games would be used to help to develop and refine fine motor skills necessary for everyday survival. Many contemporary games children play today
can have their origins placed in games that were around and played by many traditional indigenous peoples. Games like archery, foot races, lacrosse, field hockey and wrestling, soccer, any dice games, these can all be traced back to their origins with indigenous peoples. for a very, very long time, like as old as you are there, they would hang on to that. It would be something special for them. And so what they would do is they would do several things with this toy. One of the things they would do, because in Southern Alberta, the Blackfoot were a bison hunting culture, they would actually pretend that was a bison to their teepees sometimes. Or the little guy, they would hide from the little guy. And the little guy would go out hunting a buffalo. And so what he would have to do is go search for that inside.
They are to respect the equipment and they are res to respect their opponent. You do this by honoring all three parts of the game. Welcome, and thank you for coming today. Today, we're going to do some teachings on tobacco and social protocol. And I hope that you have a little bit of fun in the meantime. My name is Maggie. I'm with UABS. I sit on the Elders Council, Health Domain, and I am part of the Leadership Circle for UABS. To my left here is Alma Gar. Alma. Hello, welcome. I'm part of the uh, leadership circle as well and part of the justice domain. All right. Thank you, Alma. And this is Gaylene. I'm Gaylene and I'm uh, along with the leaders uh, domain and I am one of the speakers for the women's circle. Thank you. Today, when we start, we start when we think of tobacco. Tobacco sometimes can get very confusing to a lot of people who've never done this before. So we're going to example, put examples in a lot of places. But first, we're going to speak of Mother Earth. Mother Earth and the tree standing people and the plant people, because that's where we get all of our tobaccos at different times of the year. When we are going out, we will have all kinds of wonderful prayers and good thoughts to take the plants or to take the tobaccos in a good way with our hearts and with our minds. We also have in our understanding that when we speak of Mother Earth, we speak of Mother Earth as being somebody who nurtures us, somebody who feeds us, somebody who cares for us. And in our respect, when we go to get tobacco, when we go to get any type of medicine for any reason, we always give an offering back. And this is gonna be, the first part's gonna be about tobacco. The second part will be about social protocol because a lot of us have questions of, what do I do? How do I get started? What do I do with all this idea that I want to start a cultural journey? And most of that starts with asking an elder. Asking an elder a question and asking an elder to teach you. Now, that will be the second part. And that is really all about different types of in that social protocol we will use different tobaccos in some of the protocols in which to approach an elder or a group of elders so let's start first just with understanding and saying thank you from my mind my lips my heart to feather earth right the first tobacco that we understand, there's different types of tobacco. And people use different types of tobacco. This here is a natural tobacco. And I don't know if you can get a glimpse of this. Maybe I'll get the means to bring it closer. And 
that's an organic tobacco. That's a tobacco that somebody's grown in their field. Now, some people actually grow their own tobacco. And some people, well, if we live in the cities, you can't always get out there. And if you're a little bit like me and you're a little bit crippled up, you're definitely probably not getting out there. So we don't use that sometimes. We will use tobacco that is brought from different companies, right? We also have another one. Oh, there it is now. This one, this one's called buffalo sage. Now there's different types of sage. There's white sage, buffalo sage, there's a type of pasture sage, and other types of sage. This is buffalo sage. And from the red deer, in the Red Deer area, Sweet. sticking to my glove, <laughs> right? This buffalo sage grows around here, and it has very light green, soft leaves, and we use that sometimes as a tobacco, right? And when we talk about smut, we'll get into that after we finish our tobacco. Uh, there is usually four or five different types of tobacco that people can use. This other tobacco here, my fingers will let me get it out. Ah, there we go. This is diamond willow fungus. It comes from a diamond willow tree. And it smells very distinctive. Because there is a type of fungus that grows in poplar trees that looks just like this, but it doesn't smell the same, and it is not diamond willow fungus. The difference is the smell smells like black licorice. It's very strong when you first go out to the bush to pick it, and people will pick off small parts of it or grind it down. Sometimes they put it with three other tobacco. They'll use regular tobacco, they'll use diamond willow, and they'll use buffalo sage and sweet grass. That's going to be our last one here. Sweet grass also is considered one of our tobacco. Now, some people also use brown cedar. I don't happen to have found any, but the cedar is quite common for some people to use. Now, all of these can be chopped and picked at different times. In our school system, we've had gardens where they grow sweetgrass, where they grow some of our tobaccos. And they are now starting to teach the children about our tobacco. So that we find as a positive thing in our hearts. During this time of COVID though, that may be something that we will have to work on in a different way. But we will work on it. So those are the types of tobacco that are commonly used for the Great Plains people. Now this won't apply if you're a West Coaster from the West Coast. You will not use any of these tobacco, right? And they will not smudge in that way. They will have their own and you will need to speak to them about it. But for today, we were speaking of the Great Plains people and their tobaccos. So, 
our next one is about bamboo ties. Now I have two specific ties here. Do you know what they're for? Awkward. That's right. Why is one red and why is one white? Does anybody know? No? Okay. Red is for your physical state of being. White is for your spiritual state of being, for your ancestors and your spirit. There are some tobacco ties that are done in different colors according to their Sundance leaders or according to their tribal customs. And we all will oh, yeah. say, go to your elder and ask. Now, how do we go to the elder to ask? We offer them a little bit of tobacco. Now, let's say for some reason or another, you don't have all this tobacco or whatever. You're a cigarette? Mm -hmm. So, as, a, let's say, you're on the spot, you see an elder, and you want to ask a question. This is what they do. And before an elder accepts it, right, they will ask you, what are you asking me? Because if I cannot answer it, I will not accept that tobacco. Right? So sometimes an elder will not accept the tobacco if they do not know what you are asking, then they'll refer you to somebody else, or, and or, if they feel you are not ready. And it is not something to punish you. It is something from their heart. They will look at that and say, this is your time, or this is when we can do it, or yes, we will start this. So elders have a whole pile of their own rules. And if you ever think that you're doing it wrong, believe me, every elder will tell you when you got it wrong, right? They have no problem at being able to tell you you are not in the right path. And they will correct you. So don't ever worry about, oh, I'm going to get it all wrong. We don't have to worry about getting it wrong because they'll tell you when you got it wrong and they'll correct you. I'm also encouraging that most people, please go to your people. Please go to your elder. If they do not know, then find some other community out. Somebody that you can feel comfortable with and feel trustworthy from your heart. Right? Now, Lili wants to show how to make a tobacco tie. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll put one on. Okay, so uh, Maggie has uh, shared with me that this print here is the grandmother print, correct? And can you just tell me a little bit more about why I would use a grandmother print or when this is most appropriate? Okay, so let's say now we're going to go talk to a grandmother. Kukum and Cree, I'm not sure what they say in Blackfoot. Anybody know Blackfoot? No? Anyway, you're going to go ask a grandmother. This is a good print that we call grandmother's print, right? And it's usually flowers, soft pastel colors, very small flowers, not really big like sunflower print, but usually some small flowers and print like that. So you can see it? Yeah. Okay. Then, as we're putting this in, you're thinking of your question and you're having a good prayer and a good thought about what you do to ask and why you do ask. So you're making a tobacco tie now. That is how big. Show everybody and let's I'd see. say it's a four by four square. Four inch by four inch square. Now they can be as small as, as you say, two inch by two inch. And that would be for a different reason. So acceptability of being that big, that big, or smaller yet. 
Now, let's say we're going to go also while she's making this and thinking of her, her question and praying in her heart about what she needs to ask when she makes her tobacco tie. We're going to talk about, let's say we want to go to a group of elders. And sometimes that's like really nerve wracking. It's like, oh my God, I got to talk in front of a whole group of elders. Or I want to ask them a question. What do I do? So then you get a basket and you make more than enough for the elders that show up in that circle. And before they even allow you to sit outside and ask your question, they'll call you over and you will give each one a tobacco tie and tell them generally what you're asking of the elders. And you will pass that all the way around the circle. Then you will sit and you will listen and they will tell you how they're going to address your question or what you need to say. Maybe you're presenting something to them, a project or whatever. That is proper protocol for presenting to an elder. These protocols are shown for a cultural respect of people who have knowledge within culture, knowledge within the land, knowledge within what we call natural or earth knowledge, right? And we rely on them as a culture of people to give us a sense of guidance. And a lot of times they will answer your question only in parts. And it will feel very frustrating. <laughs> but that's part of learning patience. That's part of understanding that just like this tree and the tree standing people, they've been here for a while. And all you have to do is sit underneath this tree to enjoy it. Now, she's made her tobacco offering. Her tobacco tie. A prayer of tobacco is different. That's done in ceremony. Today we will not address that. That is not something I'm comfortable with to put on a recording. So, in passing the tie, you put it in my hand, and now you give me your question that you thought about and you prayed about. I'd like support with guidance and direction. Okay, I accept that as a beginning place. All right, now this tobacco and these two that I keep as an example, but this one in particular, I will put into a smudge and I will burn it tonight, right? And I will speak to ancestors and I will speak to them of my heart. What? this young lady needs to know, right? So that is tobacco ties and whatnot. Question, do you have any? Not right now. <laughs> Not right now? How about you? I just uh, have a, like when I was asked to bring this color to a ceremony, you mentioned that it was about the, the person running the ceremony. Can you say just a little bit more about people have different Protocols. Okay, uh, the red, from what I have in my, my sherry, is about the physical world. Sometimes red is also used to protect different sacred items. Sometimes red is really important for different things that people will have, so they'll use red cloth. But in this particular instance, red is signifying the physical state of being. We are here. We are happy. We're alive. And we know how to blow our nose. We're good, right? But mostly it's about understanding that you're on the physical good red road. 
right? And that the white signifies that spiritual growth of all your ancestors and those who've died before us. Okay? Anything else? I'm good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the teaching. And I know you're shy, but you have lots of questions, I'm sure. <laughs> and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Yes. And I hope that you have a marvelous day. Happy Aboriginal Day. Happy Aboriginal Day. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's myself, Miss Taylor, and Miss Gardy P here at St. Thomas, a party of First Nations Métis and Yotes support team. And today we are going to be making um, fire bannock. These are the ingredients that we need. We need some flour. Um, I have the Robin Hood All Purpose flour here. Uh, we will also need baking powder. Um, and we will also need some sugar, some salt, and some vegetable oil. Vegetable oil is used because it's better for the campfire. So would this recipe be different than other types of bannock that you would make? Yes, yes. This recipe is um, a shorter version of the traditional bannock, I guess, that you would make for your oven. Um, so today we are going to use um, two cups of flour, two and a half cups, sorry. We need um, half a teaspoon of salt, then we're going to use half a teaspoon of sugar. We're going to use two teaspoons of baking powder. I'm going to mix all those dry ingredients, make sure it's all, all mixed up nicely. And then we're going to make a well. Making a well is just pushing the flour to the side so that there's a little hole in the middle there. And then we want to dump the three tablespoons of oil in the middle. One cup of water. And when you have your well, it, um, you want to take the sides of the flour and mix it and blend it into the water. So that's kind of what we're doing now. Mix it up. Once you mix it all together, it's going to come like a, you want like a Play-Doh consistency. Once that's mixed, I'm just going to use my hands a bit, mix it up into a ball. And of course, before we got started, we both wash our hands really well and even use hand sanitizer. So always practicing clean hygiene and cooking. A little dry, so we have to add a little bit more water. So it could be anywhere from one cup to one and a half, but just as the consistency is what you're looking for. You want like a Play-Doh. You don't want two sticks. Grab our sticks and see if our fire is ready. The next step to uh, making bannock on a stick is the actual sticks. <laughs> so we've um, made our, our dough. And now we have our six, but prior, we have our six here, but prior to this, um, the teaching is that when you take something from the land that you give back to that to the land. And reason being is that um, everything is living here on Mother Earth. So the trees are alive, the willows are alive, the flowers are alive, the grass is alive, um, and they have spirit. And so when you take from that, from the, from the earth, um, it is to give, we offer tobacco to give thanks for the spirit of, of this willow stick um, or the tree or the flowers, anything that we take. If it's an animal that we're, you know, going to hunt or if we're fishing, it's to, it's to give a prayer and give thanks for, for this um, sacrifice that the plant or the animal um, has given it in order for us to be able to have life as well because we use this to be able to cook bannock over the fire so i just wanted to share that teaching with you and now you know with the willow we want to be able to um, shave off the end a bit so safety of course your parent or guardian an adult will be able to do that for you so they'll shave the the willow or the stick that you do get and once you do that you will then burn it over the fire 
for a few minutes and you're gonna grab your dough and you're just gonna grab a little piece of the, the dough, just grab it. Once you grab a chunk, um, just work with it in your hands. You can make it into a ball and you can then just flatten it. Um, you want it to be a little thin, like half an inch. Um, so once it's rolled flatter, longer, lengthwise, you want to also flatten it. So once it's flat, half an inch, you can also like stretch it a bit like this. It's workable, you know. So you just do that. You grab your stick and then you start from the top and you just kind of roll it down in an S or like a snake. You just roll it down your stick and then once it's down to the end, you're ready to cook your bannock on a stick. And then you just add it to the fire. Um, you just cook it until it's like brown on each side. Just keep rotating it over the fire. Not the flames, just over like maybe the hot coals or so. If you take it off and it's still sticky, then you'll need to cook it a little bit longer. Good day, everyone. It's Donna Bishop from the Red Deer Native Friendship Society and welcome to National Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, we weren't able to share our powwow with you this year, but we sure had the spirit. So we all got together today, we came out on the land, and we did what we thought was the right thing to do, which was a round dance, but we did a distance round dance with our ribbons. Why we do a round dance um, at these kind of events is to celebrate our communities, to celebrate each other, to celebrate the fact we're here on this earth, we're healthy, and we've got each other throughout the whole thing. And so from us to you, happy National Indigenous Peoples Day. We love you, we love each other, and we just love what we do. Have a great day. So right now, June 21st, we'd be already traveling to so many different powwows throughout Indigenous country. But because of COVID, you know, we're staying home, we're being creative. So I had to catch up with lead singer of The Walking Buffalo, Doug Morin. And he wanted to sing for all you guys from his drum group, Walking Buffalo Singers. So Walking Buffalo, take it away, boys.
That was such an amazing song. When it comes to drumming, there's so much camaraderie that has to go in, teamwork, the timing, and everything to learn the songs, to be all as one. Such an amazing job, boys. Way to go, Walking Buffalo Singers. Hey, how's it going? Uh, Patrick here today. I'm going to teach you guys how to set up a bustle. So if you're on your own and you don't know how to set up a bustle for your kids or whatever, hopefully this video will help. So I got my assistant Jow here. Come up close, Jow. So usually there's like two bottom strings like on each side. Sometimes there's a middle string. Uh, I have the middle string on here, so I'm going to show you guys how it works. So Jow, if you get a close up here, there's two holes at the bottom so this is the bottom and this is the top and the bars so there's holes down here and then there's holes on the side on each side of the this is called a spreader your backboard and the bars and then you have the strings to tie up tie up the bustle right so uh, I got my daughter here Vatsana helping out and I think I, I, another common mistake is sometimes people set up the, the bustle backwards like this and they'll set it up like that you ever see that <laughs> I've seen yeah, some people like yeah. that so you'll see how the feather is kind of curved like that so here's the top of the feather and the bottom so you can kind of see the difference between how the top and bottom looks so you got to make sure that this is on top and all you want to do is you take the bottom string come on close here and then you put them in the bottom holes here like that and sometimes they don't have a bottom string, that's okay. It usually just keeps it uh, so it's shaped nice. So and then you just tie it at the at the back. So I'll tie a knot. Like just like how you tie your shoe. You can get back there, yeah. It's like so. And if you're kinda worried about it untying, you could double knot it like that if you want. Then you take the two other bottom strings and you there's a hole here so this one is usually on every bustle so you'll have a hole here and then you have a hole on the other side you just pull them in nice and tight and then in the back again you'll tie it up just like how you tie your shoe Nice and tight. Hello, hello, hello. So now it'll just look like this. It's all tied up. The last step, all you gotta do is tie these strings to the bar. I do mine, uh, I wrap it. So I'll wrap it and pull it. And then here's my little trick is I'll, I'll put it around the bar, do over the string and I just shoot it up. You know, I shoot it up. I found this is a good way where it'll never come loose and you just keep doing it over and over and over again. Okay, and then the next side, same thing, you, I wrap it around once. I usually have a bead here, the, the bar, so it protects from the bar and the feather so the feather doesn't wreck. And I'll wrap it again, shoot it up. Repeat the process. <laughs> Good. So now that's all tied up. Usually the strings like a lot shorter than that, uh, just because I put new strings on here. It's kind of long. Um, I also like to like kind of, kind of smoothen out the feathers after you wrap them or you put them away, but. That's the bustle right there. It's all set. It's ready to go. Got the strings ready to tie on uh, the person who's ready to dance. And that's how you set up a uh, men's fancy dance bustle. Peace. Ta -da. Very, very proud of yourself because you did more than um, dance for yourselves and dance for your creator. You danced for this land. You know, land that long, long time ago our people lived and walked on, and our people still live and walk on it today. So 
Not only did you dance for yourself, for the land, for Creator, you danced for each and every one of us. You looked at our hearts. And I'd like to uh, thank, I would like to thank the ancestors, our grandmothers and great-grandmothers, our grandfathers and great-grandfathers, all the ones who walked in a good way, all those ones that at one time had to hide, their ceremonies, their songs, their pipes, all the ones who made it, and all the ones who picked it up and are continue to get, continuing, continuing to get stronger. And continuing to show a good way. I'm really proud of all of our dancers, I'm really proud of all those ones who carry drums. I'm really proud of all the elders that continue to leave us good tracks to follow. And I pray for them, I pray for my community, I pray for the strength of the buffalo to continue to surround our communities with love, endurance, strength. These things I pray for that we can keep, keep going. All my relations, I think. All right, so that kind of concludes our little ceremony that we had here today. Thank you guys so much for showing up uh, on behalf of uh, Chinook's Edge, uh, Red Deer Aboriginal Dance Troupe, UAVS, Elders, everybody. Thank you guys. Thanks, Corky. And, you know, it's... It's so good to see all the familiar faces here again, and we'll, you know, we'll pray for you guys tonight. And you guys go out and have a good supper, and uh, have a good weekend. I think uh, the rain is coming, so enjoy the weather right now as uh, we get some blessings from the rain. So thank you guys so much for being here today. Hi, hi. Thank you. Hi, hi. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, what a beautiful day, a beautiful event this was for National Indigenous Day. I want to say thank you so much for all the artists that came together, the elders, the knowledge keepers, the veterans, all the organizations that made this day a possibility. So from the bottom of my heart, the Naskaman, thank you so much. I love you guys all, and we will see you again. See you later.